Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 350, the Jerusalem edition. I have on the other line David Poligli, and we're going to talk a little bit about the latest news here from America and a global perspective of the Middle East and some of the anti-Semitism we've seen uh, continuing to grow. Uh, I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm David Pelegi from Jerusalem. Well, we haven't had you on the show for a little while. Uh, last time I talked to you, there was uh, a little bit of uh, violence going on in Jerusalem. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, there was some violence at the, the Temple Mount, and I didn't get a chance to talk to you. I said, well, I'll call David in a little while. Something in, Something's going to happen in the news, and I'm certainly going to have him on. Lo and behold, President Trump decides that uh, after 70 years, we can finally recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. There's pros and cons to this, of course. And I thought I would get your perspective as a citizen of Israel and an occupant of Jerusalem yourself as to what the feeling is over there to this type of news. We're not uh, technically citizens of Israel. We're uh, our family. Uh, we're residents. Residents, that's and, right. Uh, certainly, we consider ourselves Jerusalemites. We have been here for um, 37 years. Wow. Uh, living in uh, Jerusalem. So, um, we, uh, our perspective on this. Well, you know, we think Jerusalem is uh, uh, incredibly important, and uh, we think there is some. Uh, even in the old Jerusalem, some spiritual and theological significance. But I may get into a little bit of trouble with some of my friends uh, who are slightly more ardent than I am. But uh, I, I wasn't, uh, I don't think we were so uh, excited about this news. It was just a, um, just a, you know, it's just a reality. The, uh, the Supreme Court is here, the, the Parliament is here, all the government of, uh, uh, ministries are here, and whenever U.S. diplomats want to do business with uh, Israeli uh, government officials. They they need to come to Jerusalem. So it was a really silly, uh, silly thing that the the um, United States and other nations in the world uh, just wouldn't re recognize uh, what is obvious. So uh, on that score, we're I think we're we're kind of gratified. Does it mean a lot, Kevin? Uh, I'm not so sure if it means so much. But yeah, I, I have to agree with you. In the long run, maybe not. In the short run, it's uh, going to have a, a lot of political play uh, with people here in America and with the United Nations. Um, we talked. We mentioned anti-Semitism. In my short time here on Earth, I've never seen a more anti-Semitic organization than the United Nations uh, singling out Israel for so many uh, different things that just don't exist. It's a completely different reality. Uh, according to the United Nations, uh, the worst place you could be if you are female is Israel. Uh, the worst place you could be uh, if you want peace it, uh, or democracy or anything is Israel. And they keep picking on Israel. And I see this as anti-Semitism. It is, uh, it is anti-Semitism. It's largely uh, an Islamic form of anti-Semitism. Uh, there are, what, 50, 60 Islamic countries uh, in the General Assembly, if not more, uh, along with a number of uh, countries from the, uh, from the global south with uh, large Muslim minorities. And uh, it is certainly uh, very easy to pick on Israel. But it, it is certainly... Um, unfortunate uh, for the United Nations because in a way the United Nations has really totally destroyed its credibility uh, when they as you said pick on Israel over and over again and believe me Kevin we have our problems there's a lot of unfairness here there is certainly um, problems between Israel and the uh, Palestinian population and its uh, Arab minority uh, some of Israel, some of Israel's policies are wrong and immoral uh, and unethical, uh, and yet when the UN condemns Israel like this over and over again, uh, people in Israel tend to circle the wagons, and they don't, uh, unfortunately, don't hear legitimate criticism uh, of their st uh, of their state or their uh, or, or their country. So uh, when the UN doesn't address China human rights in China or doesn't 
address human rights in Iran, or it doesn't address the, the place of women uh, in Saudi Arabia and picks on Israel. It's just making itself uh, totally irrelevant. And the world does need uh, a good functioning uh, United Nations organization. And uh, unfortunately, it's uh, consigning itself to the, uh, it's committing suicide, it's shooting itself in, uh, in the foot like this. So. All right, well, as long as I have you on, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the growing conflict in the Middle East. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you know this. It's getting yeah. worse and worse. Uh, it's not getting as much play over here in the press in America. Uh, Europe is busy with their problems. But well, you're just seeing the U.S. with uh, sex scandals to notice that uh, we have a incredibly dangerous situation developing in the north uh, on the uh, on the border mm -hmm. uh, between Israel and Syria. Uh, well, I think influenced by Iran, uh, Russia. Uh, I I think one of the most uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, countries in the history of earth would be iran uh Correct. you know um they deny the holocaust uh they want to influence everybody uh saudi arabia saudi arabia is finally on to iran and trying to uh, stop some of the influence but there's a tinderbox going on right now on the border with syria um tell us what's going on well recent just uh i think yesterday we, we called upon our uh, supporters of Christchurch around the world to really to begin to uh, uh, to pray uh, about the um, growing influence of Iran uh, in Syria. Uh, the Iranians are without question trying to establish a, uh, a land bridge or a, a land belt, whatever you want to call it, uh, between Tehran uh, and Beirut, uh, running through Iraq uh, and running through Syria running through, um, of course, uh, parts of parts of Lebanon. They want to do this in order to uh, exert uh, control and influence throughout the Middle East. They also uh, want to confront Israel, uh, and they want to destroy Israel. And if you want to talk about uh, Iranian anti-Semitism, since the, the Islamic Revolution, 1980, they have been calling uh, on a regular, repeated basis uh, for the destruction of the state of Israel, and even the annihilation of uh, the, the Jewish people who live here. That is genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, the world refuses to call them out for it. Uh, the world refuses to acknowledge it or refuses to discuss it. Uh, and yet, um, Jewish people, with their past experience, especially in Europe, know that when someone makes a threat like this over and over and over again, you darn well better take it uh, seriously. And the Iranians are trying to uh, bring about a situation where they have uh, permanent military presence uh, in Syria, just, uh, just miles from the Israeli border on the Golan Heights. They want to bring, according to uh, what they tell us hundreds of thousands of Shiite volunteers to, to uh, come and sit on the border and you know it's going to happen. There's going, Israel is not going to allow this. Oh, by the way, they want a Navy base in northern Syria. They're apparently building missile bases uh, in uh, missile factories in Lebanon. They've already armed uh, their allies, Lebanese allies, Hezbollah, with a hundred thousand missiles. Now, Hezbollah has more missiles than any nation on Earth, with the exception of um, Russia and the United States. And they are a terrorist organization. Um, so uh, all of this means that Israel isn't going to take this sitting down. Last weekend, Israel bombed uh, a um, Iranian military base, again, not very far from the Golan Heights, to send a signal to the to the good old U.S. of A., to Russia, and to Iran itself, that it's not going to tolerate uh, the presence of Syrian soldiers, I'm sorry, Iranian soldiers, the country that's been calling for its annihilation since 1980. Uh, they're not going to uh, take this sitting down, and this very well could lead to a war, 
could be a war between Israel and Iranian proxies, but it won't stay there. It no, be, because they it, both have friends, don't they? They both have friends. It could be a regional war, and it's going to be very complicated because we have Russia involved. We have the United States dithering. The Trump administration, on one hand, uh, rewarded Israel by uh, announcing, uh, uh, declaring Jerusalem to be its capital, and on the other hand, refuses to, to uh, tell the Russians or tell the Iranians you can uh, there can be no Iranian presence uh, in Syria you know after the after the war uh, is resolved so let me tell you the scenario if, and again this is uh, we need to be watchful and prayerful I'm reminded of the um, the passage that we read in mark 13 uh, uh, just last Sunday um, the scenario very easily could be a war between uh, Israel, again, Israel and Iranian proxies, could then involve Iran, could then involve Hezbollah, it could then the Russians somehow could come in, the Americans might be sucked into this, um, and, you know, there goes, uh, there would be a regional war, if not something even bigger. I've been here 37 years, Kevin. I'm not generally not an alarmist. I don't get, jump up and down about uh, a lot of developments, but I think this is one of the most frightening developments I've seen uh, since I moved to Jerusalem many years ago. My radar went off when I heard that uh, Saudi Arabia was talking to Israel about the Iranian <laughs> problem, That's right. and I said, "Okay, this is it's way out of hand." And nobody knows what's going on. Uh, this is this is section C, page four of the New York Times. Uh, yeah. it just you know, if only somebody over there could have a sex scandal, they could make the front page of our papers. But uh, oh, I don't no. see that. Um, one of the problems we've seen, at least uh, in the last twenty five years, is whenever a um, bad person who's leading the country, Saddam Hussein. Uh, uh, Assad, others fall, it leaves this power vacuum. And it's filled by the next most powerful uh, nation sitting on its border. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, th this is um, th this is certainly a problem. But you know, equally a problem is um, the fact that most of the Arab states, uh, and Iran is not an Arab state, and neither is Turkey, they, they're very weak. Uh, the nation state uh, is very weak. So you have, uh, uh, for example, uh, Hezbollah or Hamas. You you have is, uh, Islamic extremist organizations or uh, Islamic organizations that uh, that really call the shots. And uh, if you go back to my scenario for a moment, uh, if there is a war between Israel and Hezbollah, which is very likely, and I can tell you from uh, uh, folks in our parish who serve in the military here that the, uh, the Israeli army is training, training, training um, for that eventuality because they expect the war to break out between Israel and Hezbollah and, and in Gaza and the south at the same time. And they're going to end up being a lot of civilians on both sides uh, being killed. And it's going to be very, very tragic. So again, I go back to my, uh, just urge your listeners to be prayerful, to be watchful, to be to pray that uh, uh, the U.S. And, uh, and Russia will act responsibly, uh, calm the situation so that uh, we don't have to go through uh, another round of bloodletting. Um, now, a lot of people, and this is the failure of our high school education uh, geography uh, lessons, don't know how big Israel really is. Currently, the size of the size ahead. of New Jersey. Yeah, it's a small little uh, uh, place on the coast, and uh, you know, if you want to, top to bottom, it's longer. Uh, uh, the size is longer, but uh, east to west, you can't uh, get to third or fourth gear before you've uh, crossed both borders. Now you could um, you could drive from uh, Herzliya to the Jordan Valley. Uh, on a good day without traffic, probably in an hour and 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, uh, and that's through some hill country. So 
you're talking about 50 miles at the widest. Uh, so yes, it's it is a little country, but it uh, is very its existence uh, is very irksome uh, to to many Muslims and to Iran uh, especially. And uh, we have uh, Palestinians certainly do have real issues about land and water, uh, refugees. But at the end of the day, the conflict is a, it's a it's a religious conflict uh, that uh, really. Uh, uh, is about Islamic theology as much as it is about anything else. And this, by the way, this is not only my opinion. Uh, at GAFCON in Nairobi five years ago, I heard uh, Michael Nazarali uh, say the same thing. And I'm not sure he's a, a raving, ardent Zionist or anything, but he recognizes what many, people, many of us recognize that you're talking about really a religious spiritual conflict that's that's going on here. A major market in Israel is tourism. Uh, and, you know, I've been to Egypt and other places. Uh, tourism in Egypt has been wiped out. Uh, there's just not much left there after they had their Arab Spring. Um, what happens to tourism as this conflict uh, starts to grow? Well, this year we had, by the way, we had three million tourists, mm -hmm. and uh, I've had the pleasure of, uh, of uh, have had the, the pleasure of having you on tour with us. Sure. Uh, and um, you remember that climb uh, in the desert? That <laughs> <laughs> I could do it. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Look, if uh, bullets start to fly, then people will people will stop coming. And uh, that's the, the way it is. I don't want to discourage anybody by, by saying all these things. If you're planning a trip to Israel or you're coming to GAFCON, you should plan on coming. But uh, you, you need to, all of us need to, uh, to be praying. I know, again, we're in the middle of the Christmas shopping, uh, Christmas season. People are shopping. People are uh, opening the Internet uh, to find out who is, who is the latest celebrity victim of the uh, of the yeah, sex scandals in America, and uh, we're very easily distracted. But uh, we're distracted by things that I'm afraid are not are not really important. No, not at all. So, all right, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, it's what almost uh, it's after six over there. So uh, you you have been very generous. Go grab some supper. Say hi to the family, um, and I, I do look forward to our next uh, conversation. Uh, I hope you will call me during peacetime and not wait for a crisis. Well, uh, we didn't get... Uh, to, let's talk about the Temple Mount real quick. Um, about a month and a half ago, there was a conflict there. Now they have metal detectors. You took a, a group that I was with there. Um, it's a tense place on a good day. It is, it is a tense place. Uh, I don't want to, to be uh, overly mystical. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is, um, I remember uh, Gavin talking uh, about um, Carl Jung and uh, spiritual warfare not long ago. It, it is, without going into detail, I think people need to know that there is, uh, without finding it uh, here and now, there is some, there is some intense spiritual warfare uh, over that place. And, uh, again, uh, we need to... Uh, we need to pray. Many Christians will say it's not important. It has nothing. It has nothing to do with us. Uh, but still, um, uh, you know, there is uh, a war, a, a conflict. It's not just about two nation states uh, and their identities, uh, or two peoples, the Palestinians and but uh, and the Israelis. Uh, but again, we we need to see a little bit. Uh, we need to see behind the headlines. Uh, and I hope we can pray in, a, in an intelligent and mature way uh, for peace in this part of the world. It's enlightened self-interest at the end of the day, Kevin, meaning uh, it's about peace and security yeah. in Topeka or Toledo as much as it is about Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or Tehran. Yeah, I mean, done incorrectly in the next uh, two dozen years, uh, we could see no Israel uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and that's it's unfathomable and 
the civilian destruction and death to do that uh, is a repeat of World War II. Yeah. You're talking about states with nuclear weapons now. Uh, Iran has nuclear weapons. Saudi Arabia wants nuclear weapons. Other countries will now be getting nuclear weapons. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a very frightening, frightening time. And uh, maybe for Americans, again, we need to pray for our government to have wisdom and to act decisively uh, in this part of the world. I know a lot of my fellow countrymen are probably tired of the Middle East, say we're not the world's policemen. We're tired of Afghanistan. We're tired of Iraq. We just like to pack up and go home. But we can't do that. Uh, we will leave a vacuum uh, and uh, to mix a metaphor, it will come back to bite us and uh, hurt a large, a large part of the world. Well, so you, we, need to, we need to stay. The, we need to stay involved uh, and, and work for really work for uh, peace in this part of the world. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East um, right now. Right. At least for the last oh, 18, 20 years, it's been uh, activated with hyper capitalism. There's uh, certainly a lot of growth uh, going on there. Technology is, is really taking off. Small business is taking off. Um, it's a little mini America uh, in the Middle East. Well, it is. It is. Um, it, it is in many ways, but not totally. It is Western. Mm -hmm. uh, it does. Uh, it does uh, emulate the West, but of course, it has a Jewish Middle Eastern uh, flavor to it. And uh, all these Arab states and even Iran who want to wipe out and destroy Israel, and the ironic thing is that Israel, uh, even in all its imperfections, uh, is actually the solution to the Middle East. Uh, we have a free press. We have a fair amount of tolerance, not always. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, the rule of law. Um, we have uh, a... Uh, it's a good place. Okay, it need need some improvement. It's a good place to be a woman. It's mm -hmm. a good place to grow up. Um, you know, this this is what a, a a lot of Middle Easterners, even those who hate Israel, actually at the same time uh, admire Israel and wish that they could uh, emulate uh, Israel at the same time. You know, every year, every every year, and every two years, especially, we bring. Um, Muslims who become Christians to, to Israel and we network, pray together, and strategize about ways that we can, uh, together with Israeli Christians and Egyptian Christians and Jordanian Christians and Lebanese Christians, we can advance the kingdom of God. And all of these, uh, to, just to a man, to every man, every woman who comes to Israel, they say, I, when I get to Israel, I can breathe. I don't feel that oppression. Mm -hmm. that, that, that Islamic uh, heaviness that you have in Israel. Here it's free. Uh, it's a sense of freedom. And they all want to stay here. Unfortunately, the Ministry of Interior here in Israel won't. Well, I was reminded while uh, cleaning up my closet uh, uh, this weekend. Uh, Is that the prayer rug? That's the prayer rug. <laughs> a prayer shaw, uh, the uh, gentleman who boarded our bus said um, that uh, uh, was made in Bethlehem. And, uh, uh, you know, it, the, uh, Israel is an amazing place. And if you get the chance, I cannot, you know, exhort you enough, go. Uh, yeah, it's, it's tense over there and uh, the future is uncertain. But uh, now you uh, are the rector of Christ Church in Jerusalem, you have a side job as well. That's right. I, I uh, my tent making is uh, to do tour guiding. Uh, mm -hmm. My uh, our, our church is poor and they can't uh, provide a salary, so uh, I do uh, three or four tours a year. Where we take mostly Anglicans, praise the Lord, around, <laughs> and uh, we study uh, the uh, Jewish roots of our faith. Uh, and how that's important for helping us to understand Jesus and actually to be better disciples. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to turn people into Jews and stop them from eating lettuce, bacon, and tomato sandwiches, but uh, hopefully touring Israel will uh, really, uh, again, help us to understand Jesus better mm -hmm. and uh, 
to be obedient to him and and that, as a result come into kind of a greater intimacy uh, with him. So that's my side job. We go to Poland once a year to study uh, Jewish history and the Holocaust, usually in the summer, and uh, but about four times a year, including before GAFCON, uh, I'll be taking some bishops around. Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for your time again. Go get some uh, supper. And uh, I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm David Pelagi. And you've been watching episode 350 of Anglican Unscripted.